So you've pro probably seen this before. If you have atherosclerosis, so if you uh, didn't listen carefully to uh, Dr. Pownall's uh, lecture earlier and you've got uh, you've done things to lower your HDL, you've intentionally raised your HDL, and you like to smoke, uh, and you eat too much, this is what you get. It's said that you live with atherosclerosis, you die with thrombosis. So here are the things that we deal with. On your left, a partially occlusive thrombus. This is uh, sort of the paradigm for non-ST segment, elevation, acute coronary syndromes. There's a big clot there nonetheless. On the right, uh, a completely occluded, occlusive thrombus. This is the paradigmatic model for ST elevation MI. We know this pretty well in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s. There was controversy here. What was pre-mortem, what was post-mortem? Did the cardiologists know it or did pathologists know it? By the time we get into the uh, early 80s, it's written in stone. By that time, there's plenty of evidence showing that if you have an ST segment elevation MI, and you get catheterized, you have an occlusive clot in your vessel. It's not a post-mortem phenomenon. If you have a non-ST segment elevation MI, odds are very high that you have a non-occlusive thrombus. And then 2015, we have other ways of inducing thrombosis in the coronary arteries. And if you don't get the hint, it's by injuring the arteries. Blood vessels do not like to be injured. You will spend the rest of your lives doing things to prevent that response to injury. We learned that very early on in the balloon angioplasty era, and we learned it very early on in the stent era. And in fact, when you do a balloon angioplasty and you inject indium-labeled platelets into a rabbit, you'll see within the first hour there's a tremendous rush of platelet deposition. And in fact, if you try to induce experimental thrombosis in animals, this is how you do it. So this is uh, the model that we usually use. Plaque rupture occurs. The body says, oh, shit, somebody's stuck something in me. I better stop the bleeding. Little does it know it's because you've eaten and smoked too much. So what happens? You've got a ruptured plaque, and the first response is driven by platelets. So think of platelets as the fire chief. In medical school, we learned that they form a plug, and that stops bleeding. Well, that's part of what they do. The other thing they do is they get there like the fire chief responding to a fire, and they coordinate the thrombotic response. They decide when activation has to occur and when a plug is formed, and they call in reinforcements. So classically in a thrombus, you start with a platelet layer, and then you get the red clot that those of us who shave in the morning see when we look in the mirror after shaving. That's because the platelets have called in the soluble coagulation cascade. So remember that. Surgeons know it. Cardiologists have a tough time learning it. That's the way clots form. So platelets adhere to a ruptured plaque. Uh, their adhesion is largely uh, moderated by collagen and uh, GP, uh, its interaction with uh, actually GP6, uh, as well as uh, von Willebrand factor and platelet GP1B59. Uh, Following adhesion, something separate occurs. Activation. This is internal signaling in the platelet that tells it you've got to change shape, you've got to release a lot of other prothrombotic factors, you've got to flip your surface membrane around to promote thrombosis. And then finally, aggregation occurs. Platelets stick together. This is moderated largely by the interaction of fibrinogen and GP2B3A. It's integrin-mediated. Cardiologists have a tough time separating these phases. When I show slides, everyone understands it. You walk out the door, they immediately get mixed up. Don't get mixed up. Understand how this stuff happens. OK, this is more of the same. We don't need to see that. So effective classes of antiplatelet therapy. There are four that you need to know about. Aspirin cyclooxygenase 1 inhibitor, probably to a small extent a cyclooxygenase, well, never mind. Think of it as a cyclooxygenase 1 inhibitor. Largely, this blocks amplification of the uh, platelet activation sequence. ADP and the P2Y12 receptor antagonists. Who knows what P2Y12 is? 
Okay, great. When we're done, you will. Who knows what the ADP receptor is on platelets? Raise your hand. Okay, great, because there is no the ADP receptor. There are three different ADP receptors on platelets, and they're each targets of different therapeutics that are being developed. These largely block activation and subsequent aggregation of platelets. Primarily, they are not anti-aggregants, although that's one of the downstream effects. GP2B3A antagonists block aggregation. They do not change. They may even stimulate activation. Physiologically, they work very different than the P2Y12 antagonists. And finally, who knows what PAR1 is? Proteus-activated receptor 1. Ever heard of it? Well, when Merck ever gets their stuff together and uh, works on marketing uh, Zontivity, which is their uh, PAR1 uh, antagonist, they will make sure you hear about it. This is the primary thrombin receptor on the human platelet. So aspirin irreversibly inhibits COX-1 and therefore prevents formation of thromboxane A2. Thromboxane is a proaggregant and it's a vasoconstrictor. Probably if you have CAD, at least as of 2015, you need to be on indefinite therapy with aspirin. It's probably not indicated for primary prevention, although the studies aren't exactly concordant. The they're so close to the line of unity that the pendulum shifts every year. When patients ask me, should I take an aspirin a day, I say you only take it in the years when the pendulum is swung to the positive side, then stop it for a year until the next study is done and you're okay again. The optimal dose of aspirin is 81. Raise your hands if you don't know what the number 81 means. It's not 325 milligrams, it's 81. 81, any questions? Okay. And currently, there are a lot of investigations underway to try to drop aspirin from multi-drug regimens. The thinking being, and it's completely unconfirmed, we really don't know yet, if you're on a lot of other powerful antiplatelet drugs, maybe you really don't need aspirin as we started out believing. That's for future mix. When I'm in a retirement home, you can choose my therapy. Okay. The ADP receptor, which we used to talk about until uh, people learned that human platelets have three ADP receptors, P2X1, which you probably won't ever hear about, P2Y1, and there are investigations underway to try to develop antagonists to P2Y1, and P2Y12. Last time I looked, there were 14 different P2Y receptors in the human body. So if you stimulate P2Y12, you trigger a uh, G-protein coupled uh, pathway that largely acts in synergy with other platelet activation pathways and leads to platelet activation, shape change and secretion, and downstream leads to sustained platelet aggregation. That's a downstream effect. That is not a direct effect. The antagonists of P2Y12 you will deal with every day, clopidogrel, Ticlopidine, which you probably won't ever use anymore, and prazogrel. So clopidogrel and prazogrel are phenopyridines. They are prodrugs. They are converted in the liver into active drugs that block P2Y12. Ticagrelor or Berlinta is a direct antagonist of P2Y12. It does not need to undergo hepatic conversion. And cangrelor, an intravenous ATP analog, was very recently approved by the FDA. This is an intravenous drug that has a half-life of seconds, gets on board really quickly. So if you have a patient, for example, who in the emergency room has had a cardiac ar arrest, is intubated, you take him to the cath lab, you put a stent in him, uh, you want to give him a P2Y12 antagonist, but you can't get, you know, for some reason you can't get tablets down the NG tube, you will be able to give him Cangrelor. Okay, other things about the P2Y12 antagonists. Phenopyridines, again, ticlopidine, clopidogrel, prazogrel, prodrugs with quote unquote irreversible binding. The non phenopyridines, direct acting, ticagrelor and cangrelor. Clopidogrel, good guy and bad guy. You take a couple of tablets of clopidogrel, there's a very variable response to it shown here. 
So if each one of us took 600 milligrams of, of clopidogrel, we'd all have different platelet responses. Largely, we think, determined by our, the genetics of the CYP450 enzymes in our liver. If you happen to have one of the mutations in CYP2C19 that's present in about 30% of people in North America, varies depending on your ethnicity, you will have impaired metabolism of clopidogrel to its prodrug. So you'll produce less active metabolite, you'll be less sensitive. And it has been shown that if you have a reduced uh, conversion rate, so if you are a hyporesponder based on simple tests of platelet reactivity, you are more likely, if you've had a stent, to suffer stent thrombosis or its clinical manifestation, MI, or that event's clinical manifestation, which is death. All bad things. To us in the interventional world, stent thrombosis is worse than death, but that's arguable. Anyway, shown multiple times, this is the biggest study, the ADAPT-DES study that's shown it. The problem is, and you need to know this, there is no study done that shows that if you've come up with this finding, that we have any therapy, no matter how intuitively obvious it is, that changes that. We still live by that and die by these decisions, but so far no study, and none of them are very good, but they still don't exist, to show that reacting to those findings changes much. The other issue is the use of protein pump inhibitors and clopidogrel. In vitro, they, interfere, they interact adversely by competing for CYP2C19. Uh, clinically, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Bottom line, on top of aspirin, ticlop, uh, yeah, on top of aspirin, as we learned in the early 90s, ticlopidine, and now its uh, son, clopidogrel, is better than, e than either warfarin or aspirin alone after stenting. Boy, that's bad grammar. In patients with intracoronary stents, treatment with a P2Y12 antagonist is absolutely mandatory. Right now, if you can't take one of these drugs, you shouldn't have a stent. Repeat, if you cannot take one of these drugs, no stent, period. It's absolutely mandatory for a minimum of one month after a bare metal stent, a minimum of six months for drug-eluting stents. Now, John told you 12 months. There are also studies that show three months. 30 months is better than 12 months. So probably if you tolerate it, you're better off staying on it. If it has to be stopped after somewhere between three and six months, you probably can do it. There's still a lot of controversy there, but in patients who tolerate it, longer is probably better. In patients with acute coronary syndromes, including STEMI, who receive aspirin, Clopidogrel is better than aspirin alone, and P2Y12 antagonists caused increased bleeding during cardiovascular surgery. When possible, clopidogrel should be stopped about five days before, prasugrel seven days preoperatively. You'll spend a good part of your life negotiating that with your surgical colleagues. They want patients to be off these forever. They'll tell them 10 days. They have no idea why, but then, probably because someone's told them something stupid in the other session. But, you know, well, it's true. Uh, but after about four days, you've got adequate hemostasis to get you through surgery. Okay, prazogrel and ticagrel. Or prazogrel is better than clopidogrel for ACS for inpatients going to PCI, not managed conservatively. There is a black, not yellow, but black box warning for patients over age 75, those with prior stroke or TIA, and patients who weigh less than 60 kilograms. Ticagrelor is better than clopidogrel for ACS uh, patients, PCI or not. There may be a mortality benefit. I don't really believe it, but everyone else in the world does. There's controversy about the aspirin dose, but there's no reason on God's green earth you ought to be giving patients 325 a day. GP2B3 antagonists. When I was younger, like Dr. Lin, this was hot stuff. There's a lot less interest today than there was before. The fibrinogen receptor, GP2B3A, or integrin alpha 2B beta 3, mediates homotypic 
platelet aggregation. That means platelet to platelet uh, via binding to fibrinogen. There are about 60 to 100,000 of these receptors on the surface of each platelet. There are three antagonists around. There's a monoclonal antibody, abciximab, that's Riapro. There's a peptide, uh, or rather a peptidome, a peptide, that's eptifibotide, and a peptidomimetic, which is tyrofiban. So Riapro, Integralin, and Agristat, as they're known commercially. Um, their use has declined considerably over the last decade, probably better stents, smarter operators, more aggressive use of P2Y12 antagonists. They're now used primarily to treat intraprocedural complications of PCI. If you use them, you've got to use less heparin, and they may uh, obviate the bleeding advantage of bivalirudin that we're not going to talk about. And then finally, there's the protease-activated receptor that uh, um, entirely beyond uh, scope here. We won't talk about that. You will hear about that in days to come in the drug Vorapaxar. Okay, guys. Optimal dose of aspirin, remember, 81. Write it down. Solomon, write it down. Bashar, write it down. I don't want to see 325 in the order sets. Thanks.